Hi, everybody. A very good welcome to all of you. This is the third and the concluding day of our A3 work seminar. And we kickstart this event with a plenary by Dr. Rohit Nanivarikar, uh, an exemplary field biologist, an avid birder, and an expert in snake handling, and a person who can definitely rock, make a gathering rock. That's how I would introduce Dr. Rohit Nanivarikar. An alumnus from the Wildlife Institute of India, Rohit has had quite an illustrious journey. Not only did he complete a thesis, master's thesis, extraordinary, he was the first to publish in our batch on the diversity patterns of aneurysms in KMTR, but he also learned a new language in six months and came back. But it was his love for birds and the Northeast that compelled him to start his long-term association with the Nature Conservation Foundation, first as a research associate, then as a doctoral candidate, and now as a scientist. And though his doctoral research largely focused on understanding frugivory and seed dispersal by hornbills and their conservation status in Arunachal Pradesh, his current work takes a step further in understanding the patterns and processes in these forests created by these amazing birds. This plenary will give us a glimpse of his decade-long conservation efforts in the Northeast. Over the border. Thank you, Chandrima. You set very high standard for me. And I'll try and rock. Let's see how well. Yeah. Yeah. So, my actually, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yeah. So, my association with A3 actually uh, starts much before I started my master's. And when I was in bachelor's, I came and did this wonderful 15 day course in A3, uh, which was a field course in conservation science. And till that point, I was going and catching snakes and watching birds, and this is what I was doing. And this course really gave me a nice perspective of how to do ecological research and perspectives in conservation biology. And uh, little did I know that the field study which I would do as part of the course, which was basically observing frugivores which were coming and feeding on Syzygium plants in uh, KMT in uh, BRT, that that would is what I would essentially be doing for the next several years of my life and that set the context and i went to wildlife institute of india and I had a wonderful set of batchmates and some of you you may be able to recognize but they came and further joined in a3 and through them my association with ncf uh, with a3 continued and uh, so today what i'm going to talk about is essentially uh, my uh, last 10 years that i spent in arunachal pradesh studying these birds and also working with a large team trying to conserve these birds and so bulk of my focus today actually Chandrima will be on the conservation the, the research aspects and I will briefly touch on the conservation work that I've done and uh, Amit while we were coming here he was asking me this farmers of the forest would have actually confused a lot of people in a tree and therefore I was careful that I would put it in uh, inverted commas and essentially what I mean by farmers of the forest is how hornbills are playing a very important ecological role as ecosystem engineers to dispersing uh, seeds and helping the forest uh, regenerate. So tropical forests are storehouses of biodiversity. And to give you a small perspective, a 0.25 square kilometer in equator harbors as many as 1,175 plant species, which is much more than the number of species you will find in the entire temperate forests of Europe or uh, Asia or America. And one of the main reasons, one of the main hypotheses which have been put forth, which possibly explains the diversity patterns in the tropics is the jansen connell hypothesis, which highlights the need for the seeds to escape from the parent plants. And uh, in the tropical forests, 90% of the plants are dependent on uh, the frugivores to disperse the seeds. And uh, why is it important for the seeds to escape? Because under the parent plants, the seeds and the saplings face significant density dependent mortality factors either through infestation by fungus or through insect attacks or the seeds get predated upon by uh, uh, seed predators or the saplings experience heavy herbivory pressures highlighting the need for escape of the seeds away from the shadow of the parent plant 
Now the seed dispersal phenomenon itself has several different stages starting from the fruit production, fruit removal, seed dispersal, germination and recruitment. And this is a cyclic process which has been called as the seed dispersal loop. Now if you look at the variation in body sizes of frugivores, that itself varies across a large gradient. And so this is from sites across the four continents and what you see is that the uh, frugivore sizes vary from less than 100 grams to more than 1000 kilos. And uh, this itself, if you look at uh, the look at the variation in the seed lengths, while you see that the median seed lengths are somewhere between 10 to 20 millimeters, but there are a there is a representation of seeds that are extremely large in size. Now, if you look at how do these two concur, overlap, what you see here in the x-axis is either the fruit diameter or gape width, and this is the frequency plot. And the uh, oh, sorry, um, yes. And uh, this is a frequency plot. The dark uh, bars are basically the, the, uh, the that, that for the 246 plant species from Costa Rica. And the white plot, the white bars are for the 89 fruit eating bird species that are found here. And what you see on the x axis is the fruit diameter of the gape width. And you see that the median is somewhere here. But there is an extremely long tail. A bulk of the representation of fruits and the gape widths of frugivores is somewhere here. But there is an extremely long tail. And this per tail is extremely useful because that potentially allows us, there is a there are fewer plant species and there are fewer frugivore species. And therefore, it allows us an area where you can potentially explore whether frugivores are playing a role in governing the distribution of plants. Hornbills belong to this long extreme right tail. And they are amongst the largest avian frugivores that are found in tropical forests of Asia and Africa. And to give you a perspective of where they lie, we went and measured uh, uh, gape pits of the different 53 avian frugivore species that are found in Northeast India in the foothill and lowland forests. And what we found is that hornbills are here. The five species of hornbills are having the largest gape widths amongst the avian frugivores that are found there. And therefore, they offer a very interesting system for looking at what, uh, whether they are playing a role in governing the distribution of their large seeded food plants. So today in my talk, I will essentially try and demonstrate that how hornbills are playing an extremely crucial role in seed dispersal. What happens to the large seeded plants once these frugivores are lost from the system, given that horn hornbills face extreme threats, uh, significant threats because of hunting and logging pressures. I would also try and demonstrate what's the status of hornbills in Northeast India and try and link my past work with the ongoing and future work that I'm involved in. So before I go into uh, explaining the relationships between hornbills and dispersed seeds, I thought it would be useful to also demonstrate what is the relationship between hornbills and their food plants. This study was done in an absolutely magnificent place called Namdapha Tiger Reserve, which is in the extreme eastern corner of Arunachal Pradesh state, surrounded by Myanmar. And it is spread over an area of 1,985 square kilometers across a very wide elevation gradient from 300 to 4,000 meters above sea level. And this place is one of the few areas that harbors five species of hornbills and relatively very high densities. So in the months of November, December, which is a non-breeding season, some of the estimated densities of hornbills are as high as 100 hornbills per square kilometer, which is one of the highest uh, reports of hornbill densities across mainland uh, Asia. And uh, this includes the large size great hornbill, which is about four kilos in weight. Wreath and rufous neck hornbill are medium sized, about three kilos in weight. And these two are the small bodied hornbill species, the brown hornbill and the oriental pied hornbill. Now, great hornbill is classified, great hornbill and brown hornbill are both near threatened. And the wreath horn and the rufous neck hornbill is classified as vulnerable by the IUCN. Now, typically hornbills, uh, food plants, hornbills are predominantly frugivorous birds. More than 90% of their diet is fruits. And if you look at the hornbill food plants, they are typically classified as either figs, which are a rich source of carbohydrates and calcium, and non-fig fruit plants, which are a rich source of lipids, and therefore high energy uh, food plants. Now, we looked at uh, what are the diets, relative contributions of figs and non-figs in the diet. And what we find is that in the case of the great hornbill, there is a high contribution of figs in the diet, while in the case of the wreath hornbill, the contribution of non-figs is significantly higher, while rufous neck hornbill is somewhere in between. So uh, what we also found, we looked at resource tracking by hornbills across multiple spatial scales. And this is not essentially, I just wanted to establish that there is a relationship between uh, hornbills and their food plants. And we explored this relationship at multiple scales, the smallest scale being the at the, the scale of the fruiting tree and the largest being the temporal availability of fruits at the level of the landscape. And what we found is that the great hornbills were tracking 
fake fruit resources at the smallest scale and the rufus net hornbill was tracking non fake fruit resources at the smallest scale what i mean by tracking is there was greater visitation rates of these birds on the respective trees with uh, larger ripe fruit crop sizes in the case of wreath hornbills what we found it was uh, what we found was wreath hornbills were numerically much more abundant than the other two species in the non in november uh, in the non breeding season that is in the months of november and december the densities of wreath hornbill was as high as 60 birds per square kilometer while these two birds were about 6 to 7 birds per square kilometer and uh, these birds uh, these wreath hornbills were doing altitudinal migration that is they were the peak fruit availability of non fake fruits was actually much higher in the months of november december in nandha which is the middle elevation forest and wreath hornbills were coming into those areas in november december and at the onset of their breeding season towards march and april they were moving down in the lowland forest now a complementary study by aprajita has found that in the lowland forest there actually peak fruit availability in the breeding season and the fruit availability in the non breeding season goes down and this is what the wreath hornbills are essentially tracking across much larger scales now given that hornbills are have are related are their distributions are probably governed by the distribution of fruit plants we also wanted to see whether hornbills in turn are governing the distribution of dispersed seeds now this uh, the information which i'm going to present is from two sites this is part of some of which is part of my phd work and some of which is part of the work which i have been involved in after my phd which is also been in uh, another very important site for hornbills the pakhi tiger reserve pakhi tiger reserve is spread over an area of 861 square kilometers another absolutely beautiful place and very important site for hornbills in the landscape now if you want to evaluate the role of a frugivore in seed dispersal what you typically the framework that has been provided is you evaluate it in terms of quantitative as well as qualitative aspects now the quantitative aspects involves how frequently is a frugivore visiting on a fruiting tree how many fruits it is removing per visit and the other aspect the other approach being while you can evaluate how many fruits are being removed from the fruiting tree what you can also alternatively do is record how many seeds are coming on the forest floor in the forest and see whether that is associated with hornbills itself and so we've used both these approaches in our studies the qualitative aspects i'll come to it on a bit later after i finish the quantitative aspects now the quantitative role which looks at how the frugivores are uh, how many fruits they are removing how frequently they are visiting is what i will dwell on there first So for this, we selected four large, four species of large seeded plants. Now these are extremely important food plants of hornbills during the breeding season of hornbills. We selected uh, eight fruiting trees and we observed them for more than 93 hours. For each, uh, uh, we selected eight fruiting trees and each species was observed for more than 93 hours. Now here on the x-axis, what you have is the mean visitation rate per hour, and on y-axis you have the mean fr fruit removal rate per hour. During our fruit tree observations, we observed that. the frugivores main frugivores that visited the fruiting plant fruiting trees was hornbills small avian frugivores like barbets and hillmanas imperial pigeons squirrels and primates now i want you to focus on the horizontal error bars and what you see is that the primates have relatively lower visitation mean visitation rates while all the other frugivores have more or less similar visitation rates on the fruiting trees but if you look at the fruit removal rates what you clearly see is that hornbills stand out their fruit removal rates are six times higher than as compared to other frugivore groups that are found in the area now coming to how many seeds are being dispersed now this is as i said is a alternative approach where you look at how many seeds are there in the forest floor and try and see if it is associated with the abundance of hornbills now there is a positive relationship between hornbills and their food plants but what is this relationship is essentially what we wanted to explore so for this in the intensive study area in namdafa tiger reserve this is also part of my phd Uh, in an intensive study area which is spread over an area of 15 square kilometers we had eight trails and along each trail we had 1 meter by 1 meter plots and 200 such plots so overall across the entire study area we had a network of 1600 plots which was periodically monitored to record the arrival of dispersed seeds now dispersed seeds can be easily recognized because they are devoid of the pulp and in this case we recorded medium and large size uh, large size seeds which are typically fed upon by hornbills so coming to the results this study was done across two years in a non breeding season and what we found is that in the first year we had 408 seeds in the second year we recorded found 38 seeds of 14 species and 11 species respectively of medium and large seeded hornbill food plants now we were typically interested in large seeded plants which are dispersed by hornbills and what you see is that in the first year the dominance was of the canarium strictum and the second year it is phoebe now both these species are super annually fruiting species in the landscape and you can see that there is a turnover in the dominant large seeded species that we recorded there 
Now the most interesting aspect is that the seed arrival rates. Now the seed arrival rates across the two years was anywhere between 2,300 seeds to 3,200 seeds per day per hectare, which is primarily being dispersed by hornbills, and therefore demonstrating that hornbills are playing an extremely important role in seed dispersal of these large seeded plants. Now, this is the relationship between the seed arrival and hornbill abundance across both the years. And on the x-axis is the hornbill encounter rate and y-axis is the scattered dispersed seed arrival rate. And this pattern was consistently positive. And uh, to convince Suhail, who is uh, very critical about these scatter plots, I did bootstrapping of GLMs and I found that the bootstrap confidence intervals did not overlap zero, indicating a positive association between the seed arrival rate of, uh, and the hornbill encounter rates. So I found that hornbills, they are, their distribution is governed by their food plants and they are possibly governing the distribution of the large seeded plants, of the seeds of large seeded plants. Now coming to the qualitative aspects, now qualitative aspects involves different, as, uh, different again, you can evaluate qualitative role played by a seed dispersal through different measures. One of them is the fruit handling behavior. Now typically you want the frugivore who is a disperser to swallow the fruits and take the seeds away from the plant. You do not want the frugivore or the seed disperser to typically peck at the fruits or drop the fruits under the parent plant. Similarly, what treatment do the frugivore, does a frugivore provide to the seeds? Because some frugivore are known to damage seeds in the gut during the gut in the uh, during the gut passage. While, but this is clearly established information for hornbills. Where hornbills are known to not damage seeds during the gut treatment, and they actually in, uh, enhance the germination rates of certain species of their food plants. And the third is the site of deposition. Now, this again has two aspects: how far are the seeds going away from the parent plant? and whether the sites are suitable for the germination of plants or not. I will only touch briefly upon the second aspect, but I will definitely touch on how far are they taking the seeds away from the parent plant. So coming to the first aspect, what proportion of fruits handled were swallowed? We uh, looked at, uh, we did focal observation sampling across for, across different avian frugivore groups. And uh, we, uh, the, here the, on the x-axis, you have proportion of fruits that are swallowed, proportion of fruits that are dropped, and proportion of fruits that are pecked by hornbills, small avian frugivores, and imperial pigeon. What you clearly see is that hornbills are swallowing 90% of the fruits that they're handling, while the imperial pigeons are dropping almost 50% of fruits that they're handling, and the small avian frugivores are actually pecking at 50% of fruits that they're handling, clearly demonstrating that hornbills are playing a very important role qualitative role in seed dispersal. Now, visitation length is another very important parameter when you evaluate the qualitative role because if the visitation length of the hornbills is, or any frugivore for that matter, is more than the seed retention times, the frugivore will drop the seed under the parent plant, therefore playing a poor qualitative role in seed dispersal. And therefore, what we found is that the visitation length here, you have the visitation length on the y-axis for the different uh, frugivore groups. And you see that the mean visitation length of hornbills is less than 10 minutes, while that of the imperial pigeons is more than half an hour on the fruiting trees. Now, we were interested in knowing that given that hornbills are spending less time on the fruiting trees itself, but how much time they're taking to process the seeds and disperse them. And, so, so, and therefore, we did these experiments in um, captivity in Nagaland Zoological Park, where we carried these uh, fruits of large seeded plants from Pake and we fed them to different hornbill species, including the Vreeth hornbill, Rufus net hornbill and the orient pied hornbill and recorded the time they take to regurgitate the seeds. Now, if you look at the median gut passage times of the different large seeded plants, what you see is that the median gut passage times is anywhere between 85 minutes to 156 minutes. And this is clearly much longer than the time they are spending on the fruiting tree, indicating that they are taking the seeds further away from the parent plant. Uh, beyond this, we are also interested in looking at how far they are taking away. They are playing a very important quantity role, but how far are they taking the seeds away from the plant? And therefore, what we for that, we needed information not only on the regurgitation time of seeds, but also fine scale movement patterns of hornbills. And therefore, we did this telemetry study on hornbills between 2014 and 2016 in Pakit Tiger Reserve. And this is after my PhD, where we spent say, 16 months trying to catch these amazingly intelligent birds and these are like we had to set up these canopy mist nets at fruiting trees uh, and we had to go early in the morning in the dark at 3 a.m and set these nets up and often what would happen is they would come see the nets and they would fly away <laughs> and over the 16 months of intensive field work we would go in the morning and come back by evening and keep trying keep trying we caught 17 birds we let the females and the smaller oriental pattern will go because females, if you know, as you would know, that they enter the cavity. We didn't want to tag the females because it could affect their breeding. And therefore, we didn't tag the females and we only tagged the adult birds. And we tagged about six birds 
the one brief hornbill and one uh, and five great hornbills now the tags were programmed to collect the movement data at every 15 meter yeah, 15 minute time interval and uh, this during the daytime when the birds are moving around and what we found is that the mean minimum distance moved per day for the great hornbill now if you remember great hornbill is a larger hornbill is about 7 kilometers and uh, the, for the wreath hornbill is about 24 kilometers if you look at the 95% minimum convex polygon home range size estimate it is only 2 square kilometers for the great hornbill and about 48 square kilometers for the wreath hornbill now to just to highlight that these two birds were caught around the same time their nests were with less than a kilometer away from each other and therefore they had access to the similar fruit resources yet the wreath hornbill is the one which actually ranged over a much larger area if you would remember wreath hornbills are also the species which is showing the altitudinal migration and some of the closest relatives of wreath hornbill is the narcondum hornbill which is taken off from the islands from mainland southeast asia a long time ago and has colonized had colonized narcondum islands and so this particular clade of hornbills is actually probably a long ranging uh, moves over a much larger area. Now, coming to the distribution of the locations, now this is the Pake River. On the left of the Pake River, you have the Pake Tiger Reserve and Nameri Tiger Reserve, and the Great Hornbill concentrated its movement mostly in the protected areas, but it still came out in the adjoining degraded reserve forest sites. At, in case of the Wreath Hornbill, it moved over a much larger area. This is the same Pake River, and this is the other tip of the Nameri Tiger Reserve almost. But you can see that the Wreath Hornbill actually spent a lot of time in the adjoining reserve forest and you hornbills are probably playing a role in regeneration through dispersal of seeds in these degraded forests so we have the information on gut passage coming back to the question of how far are the seeds being dispersed from the parent plant we had the information on gut passage time now for every seed we assumed a random start location which we assumed is a fruiting tree now we excluded the points which are either nest or roost trees and we integrated this gut passage time with the movement data and we determined the final location now one interesting detail we were really interested in is whether it is a nest site or a non-nest site now this is important because what happens is hornbills especially the large ones are breeding for four months the female is locked inside the nest for four months and the male is coming and feeding the fruits to the female. The female is regurgitating all the seeds outside the cavity and all the seeds are falling below the parent plant. Now, previous studies have looked at uh, what is the kind of, whether the seeds which are getting clump dispersed under the nest tree, whether they are germinating well and whether there is a greater diversity of plants. But what they have found is that because of the clump dispersal of seeds, there's also heavy seed predation and all the seeds that are falling down does not necessarily result in greater diversity of seeds being germinating under the nest trees. But in the same, while the female is inside the nest, the male is moving out outside and therefore it is probably scattered dispersing the seeds. And therefore we were also interested in looking at uh, whether the site, where the seed is eventually landing is at the nest site or away from the nest site and which we could easily do through the iterations which we did for the seed generating the seed dispersal kernels. Now here what you see on the x-axis is the distance from the parent plant and y-axis you see is the probability of seed arrival. This information for the great hornbill, the light gray is the probability of arrival at the non-nest sites and the dark uh, black one is the probability of arrival at the nest sites. Now what you see is that the probability of arrival of seed under the parent tree is extremely low, it's less than 0.1 for the great hornbill and bulk of the seeds are being dispersed away from the parent plant. Now if you see the seeds are, they are getting dispersed as far as 5 kilometers away from the parent plant and a, a very few of them are ending up at the nest sites. Similar is the case of the wreath hornbill where very few seeds are ending up at the nest sites but what you see is that if you look at the x-axis carefully, the seeds are getting dispersed as far as 10 kilometers away from the parent plant thereby these birds are probably playing a very important role in long range dispersal helping the plants to ex expand their geographic ranges and probably helping the plants to maintain the genetic diversity across subpopulations in these landscapes just to take a uh, take a short break and see where we've reached and uh, what i've probably established is that hornbills are playing a very important qualitative role and quantitative role in seed dispersal and going ahead what I was really interested in to understand what happens when hornbills are lost. Now given that hornbills are playing an important role in seed dispersal, if they are lost from the system, it should also affect their food plants. Hornbills in Northeast India face significant threats from hunting and logging. Now, hornbills are hunted for uh, several reasons including for their meat and for their body parts. Some communities in Northeast use the cask of the hornbill to adorn the headdresses while some communities in Nagaland and Arunachal use the tail feathers of hornbills to adorn their headdresses. Now, 
logging, what it can result in is loss of nest trees or loss of food plants. Now, this is a logged canarium tree. Canarium is extremely, canarium strictum is extremely important food plant of hornbill. And if hornbills are lost because of hunting directly, you are actually removing the dispersers from the forest. And therefore, you would expect that the plants, the special large seeded plants which are dependent on them for dispersal, should be affected by these uh, two threats. So logging would typically affect the adult plant composition and fruit availability, while hunting would affect the seed dispersal part of the seed dispersal loop. So this study was done as part of my PhD in Namdafa Tiger Reserve, where we did uh, we had eight trails inside the park and four trails in the adjoining reserve forest. Now, uh, we, while we wanted to really tease apart the effects of logging and hunting, it is very difficult to find you know, adjacent sites which experience either one of the threats. So ideally, we would have had to find sites which are only facing hunting pressures but no logging pressures and, or having sites which are only facing logging pressures and no hunting pressures. But these kind of combinations in Northeast India is very difficult to find which are adjacent to protected area sites. And therefore, uh, it is a combination of hunting and logging threats that we potentially we ended up exploring. So what we found is that we classified the hornbill food plants into figs and non-figs. And the non-fig food plants are further classified into species that are targeted by logging, that is the timber species, and the species that are not targeted by logging. Now you can see that the bulk of hornbill food plants are actually targeted by logging. And that mean and the number of trees per hectare at a density is actually were significantly lower in heavily disturbed sites. But if you look at the densities of figs, which are not targeted by logging, they were more or less equal across the two sites. Now, if the hornbill abundance themselves were significantly lower in the heavily disturbed sites across the different months as compared to the less disturbed site in Namdafa. If you look at the lower net seed arrival, which would be a consequence of not only dispersal limitation, but also probably source limitation, it was also significantly lower in the heavily disturbed sites as compared to the less disturbed sites. And then if what we looked at is the recruitment patterns of the different hornbill food plant species that are large seeded. And what we found is that uh, the abundance of these uh, food plants is actually significantly lower in the heavily disturbed sites across the different size classes. Now, this I'm only presenting for the smallest size class. And uh, in case of Phoebe, actually, what we found is that in the smaller size classes, that is the that is a stage of the seedling and sapling stages, this, this was a pattern we saw. But in the larger size classes, what we are seeing is a reverse pattern where actually in the heavily disturbed sites are uh, sites which had higher abundance of saplings. So thereby indicating that probably the species because of recent loss of hornbills is probably getting affected by uh, their recruitment is probably getting affected. So I hope I have convinced you that hornbills are playing a very important role in seed dispersal and probably governing the distribution of their food plants. Given that hornbills are facing so many threats, we also wanted to understand what is the status of hornbills in Northeast India. Now, uh, for my PhD, I worked in the state of Arunachal Pradesh and Arunachal Pradesh is an absolutely fascinating state. You can see the, all the areas in green and it has still vast expanses of evergreen uh, forests in the state. To give you a perspective in numbers, 60% of geographic area is under forest cover, out of which a large proportion of which is outside the protected areas. And 60% of that is below 2000 meters. Now, this is a potential hornbill habitat because hornbill distributions are restricted below 2000 meters. And areas outside protected areas are important for two reasons. One is they increase the effective habitat size that is available for the species. And it also acts as a buffer to, uh, acts as a buffer to reduce other uh, impacts of other anthropogenic threats. Now, we did a survey across 20 sites in Arunachal Pradesh, which included eight protected area sites, six reserve forest sites, and six community forest or unclassed forest sites. And we used the combination of informant surveys and field surveys to determine what is happening with hornbills in the across the sites. Now, key informant surveys were done at every site we went. We would go to different villages and talk to hunters and experienced elders. And anywhere between five to 10 interviews we would conduct at a site. And uh, we would ask them whether they had seen, these are people who were going to the forest. And we would ask them whether they had seen hornbills in, uh, in the last five years or not. Now, for the of the 20 sites, 16 sites were potentially uh, you, you, sites uh, sites which are potentially great hornbill could occur. And of the 16 sites, at five sites, locals told us that they have not seen the great hornbill in the last five year, years, probably indicating local extinction of the species. And even for the other hornbill species, including the smaller hornbill species, there were still sites with locals indicated that they had not seen the species in the last five years. 
Now coming to the field surveys. Now field surveys, hornbill densities typically, especially if they're facing anthropogenic threats are extremely low and fields, rapid field surveys are probably not uh, very effective in detecting the species. But we were able to get uh, useful information for the great wreath and rufous snake hornbill. And especially for the wreath and rufous snake hornbill, the mean encounter rates was higher in the protected area sites as compared to the RFs and unclassed state forests. Now, this pattern which we saw in the previous slide was something which we wanted to intensively study because those were rapid surveys and we were not able to really uh, account for detectability issues and all of that. So therefore, we did intensive surveys in eastern Arunachal Pradesh where we did uh, where we had Namdafa as our protected area site and we sampled four RFs and two at USF sites where we had a set network of nine trails which was monitored over two years, uh, which was monitored over one year through which we were able to estimate density estimates and the mean densities of flocks was actually higher in the protected areas as compared to the non-protected areas but here one thing i would like to highlight is that even if the densities of hornbills is lower if you remember the area outside the protected areas is a significant area in arunachal pradesh and therefore a significant population of hornbills is outside the protected areas in arunachal pradesh and therefore those areas still require some bit of intervention to side, try and find out if we can safeguard those populations in the long term. Given that I'd, I'd worked in Arunachal for the uh, for my during my PhD, a logical follow up was to look at what is happening in other states in Northeast, and therefore, and we realized that field surveys are not really effective. We also did field surveys in other Northeast states where, in about 250 kilometers of walking effort, we were able to detect two species, and of that, one species was detected only one side. But hornbills, if you remember, are culturally very important to locals. Locals are able to identify different hornbill species. Hunters are able to distinguish between different species. And we thought this is a framework which we could potentially use to understand the distributions of hornbills to generate some baselines which can be used in the long term for monitoring. And therefore, we did a combination of field surveys and uh, interview surveys across these five states, which includes uh, Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Tripura, and Nagaland. And what we did is the entire state was divided into primary uh, forests and secondary forests and low elevation sites and high elevation sites because certain hornbill species are restricted by elevation and certain species also prefer primary forests. And across these four categories, uh, we had these grids of seven kilometer by seven kilometer, which uh, we uh, then classified them into the different categories and we sampled 10% of grids of the each of those categories across the five different states. Now, we would go to each grid and we would find villagers and we would talk to them and we would ask them about uh, whether they had seen these birds in the last five years or not. But this is a protocol which was established by Madhusudan from, from NCF and his team and it has been published using uh, key informant surveys to and in, a, in an occupancy modeling framework to get to the distribution of species. And we um, Asked them whether they had seen hornbills. First, we ascertained their knowledge of the different hornbill species, and we asked them if they had seen the hornbill species in the last one year and in the last 20 years in the area of the grid. Now, here what you see is the reduction in habitat use probability over the 20 years, and what you see is that, especially for the great hornbill, rufous neck hornbill, and the brown hornbill, there is a significant reduction in the habitat use probability over the years. And these three species, if you also remember, are the ones which are uh, either classified as near threatened or vulnerable by the IUCN. Now, if you look at the detection probability, this was uh, something which we estimated using the multi-season uh, 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 single species occupancy models. The detection probability itself also had uh, reduced for all the hornbill species across the across the two time periods from 1993 to 2013 for all the five hornbill species. Now, single species uh, single season occupancy models also allowed us to get to the distribution maps. Now for this, we used four different covariates, the elevation, extent of forest cover, extent of protected area, and human population density, on a GIS, which were extracted on the GIS platform. And we uh, got these uh, uh, distribution maps of the different hornbill species in our occupancy modeling framework. And what you can see is the great hornbill distribution is restricted. All these are the protected area sites is mostly restricted to the protected areas. Now here the lighter areas have sites with low habitat use probability but darker area sites are sites with high habitat use probability and uh, great hornbill distributions were uh, restricted mostly in the protected areas. Now wreath hornbill distributions were also extremely patchy and uh, they were not very widespread in the northeast India. If you look at the rufous neck hornbill which is a species which prefers the higher elevations it is mostly restricted to areas along the Nagaland Myanmar border in northeast India. 
the oriental pied hornbill which is a species which prefers secondary forests was actually much widely extensively distributed across the landscape and if you look at the brown hornbill what i would want to bring your attention to is the probability values and you see that the pro maximum probability was less than 0.5 for the species as compared to other species where we had sites with very high probability use now this species is naturally restricted to the eastern part of northeast india it is not found in the western part of northeast india and what you see is that this species what we found is that this species is extremely patchy and rare across the landscape now how does the past work of mine was uh, links to the current and future work that i'm currently involved in is also something which i thought would be a logical progression to the talk and uh, sorry brown hornbill is one of the species now if you remember brown hornbill is a species which has which is relatively rare and patchily distributed in the landscape also it is extremely interesting species if you compare it with any of the other nine eight hornbill species we find in india brown hornbill is a cooperative breeder which none of the other indian hornbills are where the juveniles from the previous year are helping the adults in uh, rearing the ch uh, their chicks also it's it has a significantly higher contribution of animal matter in its diet and uh, also across its range which is in india northeast india myanmar and thailand we suspect that this species is making a quiet exit Myanmar is a black hole in terms of our understanding of the distribution of the species, and even in Thailand, from the studies that are done in Thailand, this species is extremely rare and only found in select sites in that area. And therefore, this is one of the species that is of conservation interest to us. And we also, it is interesting because it's a we have a contrasting species to compare with. Now you have the Oriental pied hornbill, same body size, similar gape width, everything, and yet it is very widely found in Northeast India. and this species is rare and patchy across the across its range now therefore it offers a interesting framework to compare this species with the other and try and find out what is the reason to it now one thing i would like to highlight is that these areas in northeast india are the range limit of the species and therefore typically species do occur patchily and rarely uh, uh, and uncommon are, are uncommon in the towards the range limit but this is something like a long project which i see to be involved in where we are going to ask, explore the different axes their foraging axes their breeding axes and how they are using the landscape to understand what makes one species uh, you know rare and other species common and uh, to try and see basically we think that there could be some through this comparisons we might be able to get some clues towards why the species is potentially rare and so currently we have already ongoing study on the breeding biology of the species and uh, very soon we are going to start a study which is going to explore feeding ecology have and the understanding impacts of habitat fragmentation and degradation of the species now the study where we want to do this is a extension the site where we want to do this is a extension of our long last long last scale surveys where which identified this landscape as a very important site now this is the upper assam landscape near digboy tinsukia and dibrugarh and this area harbors some of the last remaining lowland evergreen forests of assam and also this is a site where we can really ensure that the species uh, future can be potentially be secured in these areas but this landscape also experiences threats because of habitat fragmentation you can see that there are large areas with varying in size in their uh, uh, there are different fragments which are varying in size in their areas and also there are some sites that were forests in the past that have been completely cleared and are lost and therefore and yet there are some sites that are still quite large in area about spread over an area of 110 square kilometers and this is the area where we want to intensively do surveys over the coming year and try and find sites which are important for the species and try and find solutions with the forest department and with the local communities and institutions there to try and safeguard the breeding populations of white throated brown hornbill in the landscape this is also a logical expansion of the hornbill nest adoption program which was started by ncf in the in arunachal pradesh in pake where we are trying to work, where we are working with the local communities to protect hornbill nests outside protected areas from fire from threats because of fire logging and hunting and where we are we are able to successfully protect about 40 odd nests outside the protected area and um, of great breadth and ruwa and oriental pied hornbill and so addition of this species will be a valuable addition to the hornbill conservation program in northeast india and similar efforts are also being made uh, where we've done surveys in the in the nagaland area for the rufous neck hornbill in the northeast india but the core of my interest is still in understanding the ecology of hornbills and the ecological role of hornbills in these areas and bulk of my research my past research is focused on understanding the role of hornbills in dispersal of large seeded plants and now what we are doing is zooming out 
So for the last one year and the study which we hope that will continue for several years, we have been trying to document the plant frugivore networks in Pake, where we are looking across a gradient of fruit sizes, gradient of seed sizes, gradient of fruit types and gradient of frugivores themselves, from the smallest wobblers to largest hornbills and trying to document these uh, networks and trying to understand what are the processes that are governing the organization of these networks. By processes, I mean plant traits like uh, fruit size, fruit type and for, uh, seed size and frugivore traits like the gapefits. And additionally, we are also planning to invest our energies into understanding the nutrients of these different food species and trying to see if across these axes we are able to understand why these community kids are organized the way they are. Now, I spent some fascinating times watching hornbills. Namdafa is particularly close and I started off working in Namdafa when I first went to Northeast in 2006 absolutely mesmerized by the landscape, by the hornbills and all that. And I realized after I moved out of Namdafa and to other sites in Northeast, that I realized that sites like Namdafa are extremely rare. And what I was seeing that 4,000 seeds or 3,000 seeds coming in forest floor is not something that I could expect at other sites in Northeast. And I hope that in this talk today, I have convinced you that hornbills are ecosystem engineers. And in sites where the population is still intact and they're able to use their area, they are playing a very important role in seed dispersal in these forests. Now, I have explored different axes looking at the quantitative role and the qualitative role in seed dispersal, where they are removing many uh, significantly higher number of fruits and they are dispersing at significantly further uh, away from the parent plants, these uh, seeds. But hornbills are facing significant threats. Their distributions are precarious. They have, we have had reductions in the distributions over the past 20 years. And this is something which is of a worry and of concern because with not with hornbills, we are not only losing the species themselves, but we are also losing a very important ecosystem role that they are playing in these forests. And for several species, these ex distributions are extremely narrow and patchy across the landscape in Northeast India. But these times are characterized by extremely amazing uh, places that I've called my homes. For six years in Namdafa, we were camping across the, the park, across different sites with wonderful people. And this work has only been possible through support and uh, and friendship of the support of the different funding organizations and the forest department and the guidance and friendship of all the different researchers and my mentors in uh, who have helped me really get through across the day sail through across the last 10 years it's been an absolutely memorable journey and it's been a fascinating one and i hope it continues like that for uh, the next 10 years at least and here i would like to end thanks a lot thank you I hope I kept time. Kept it was within my time limit. Okay. So we have a time for two questions. So. Yeah. So thanks, Rohit, for an absolutely amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the brown hornbill and the. So there seems to be even if even with an assemblage of five species of hornbills, there seems to be a great deal of diversity in the traits. Um, so I was just wondering if the phylogenetic histories and the their ancestral uh, species of all these hornbills, whether that might have a bearing independent of all the human impacts on their ability to persist in the face of change. Absolutely spot on. So this is something I didn't put it, but there could be phylogenetic niche conservatism, which could be there where certain species are just not evolved to feed on whatever, or maybe, you know, different things in brown hornbill could be an example of that. I didn't explicitly state it because that's not the area of my expertise, but that's an axis which is definitely I'm considering to explore uh, in the future. And that I hope in the next few years we'll be able to get to that. Now, fortunately for hornbills, the phylogeny is resolved and they've got uh, the phylogeny resolved with the positions of the different groups uh, across being very clearly resolved. So that will be of very uh, important, uh, will be of importance for this to look at these axes of, yeah. Hi, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about the great uh, yeah. Um So you sh showed uh, at about 20 sites where you asked people um, how, uh, when was the last time that they saw in the last five years and so on. So I think about five up to, up to 16, 16 sites. people that 16 sites. Yeah. That they said they have not seen. Yeah. Um, and then going back a few slides, you said um, that uh, their range from the nest, I think, is about 1.2 square kilometers. Two yeah, square kilometers. Two square kilometers. Yeah. So um, I'm going back uh, when 
they maybe distributed themselves over a large area and uh, now those areas are slowly diminishing um, that's what i got from Absolutely. each class right and uh, uh, now that logging continues um, i don't know much about what hap what is happening with hunting um, do you think the uh, range would increase or continue to decrease given various other checks and balances um, about uh, you know reduction in hunting and i don't know possible reduction in logging at some point about the uh, just, just the greater on the would their ranges increase or would they just be now pocketed in these smaller areas yeah this is a very interesting question and uh, this is something which uh, will be of interest to us and this is a telemetry study is not a we don't see it as a one-off study and we hope that we are able to do some of these things to answer the specific questions that you're asking now in this thing but to answer your question slightly more tangentially because we don't have the information to tell but i would suspect it would increase to answer it directly but to answer it slightly tangentially we have a very interesting setup in parquet where uh, we have had uh, nests of hornbills inside the park like the two hornbills which i showed Similarly, there are also nests of hornbills in the reserve forest, which we are protecting with the local community. Now, this is the recent information that we've compiled together and we found that actually the, now these are some of the parameters which can be used to examine whether hornbill biology or hornbill is getting affected or not. And what we find is that actually the nesting durations or the nesting success really is not really governed by the where the nests are. So actually in the reserve forest, you would expect that the hornbills have to range over much larger areas and across you know because the loss of nature loss of food plants but still we are not capturing those signals in that information that we have there and probably they're still able to cope up with it but at least i'm sure there's a threshold beyond which it is and those hornbills are definitely ranging over much larger areas because especially the wheat hornbill we keep seeing them flying to the protected areas feeding and fly, taking a long journey back to the nests in the reserve forest and we keep seeing that but the other two hornbill species are still able to move around in the areas and uh, still able to uh, get, uh, raise sticks successfully in those areas. But yeah, it would definitely affect their movement patterns and I would expect them to be moving over much larger areas. Sorry for a long answer to a straightforward question. Yeah. Hello. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, presentation. Thank and you. Reading your I think Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm just curious about the distribution of the reef on the left. Ah. Because if you showed that the reef uh, on the eastern side of North East India is quite abundant, so I just wanted to know the western limit of you know, uh, of the reef on the of the reef on the. Because the areas where we work, uh, we go get to see the reef on the quite abundant. You see, get to see them it's abundant. Not. not. So I'm just curious. What would be the you know, western limit? So clearly North Bengal, I would call the western limit. Baksa and all that still has population of wheat hornbills. I don't know which areas are you working in? We're working in uh, Berlin Forest or Sikkim Darjeeling Himalayas. Ah, Sikkim Darjeeling Himalayas. Yeah, so what my hunch, I have not traveled in that landscape, but this is a landscape which we definitely want to extend to in the near future. But my hunch is that Sikkim Himalayas is still slightly higher and the wheat hornbill is still there in the lowland forest in Baksa area and they are probably going to the higher areas in the Sikkim in the winters when they do this altitude migration but uh, they are there in the lowland forest in Baksa and all that but they would be rare in the higher areas there I don't know why though I have to go and visit that landscape to see in terms of understand that in terms of vegetation and all of that four, four of them but the reef is very very rare, rare. yeah what elevations is this uh, let's say it starts from 500 to uh, so it should typically be there but uh, in terms of nest availability like tetramelis nudiflora and some of these species are extremely important nestry species of wheat on mills or uh, more than 85 percent of the nests are in these species i'm not sure if tetramelis nudiflora is there in the it is there but uh, yeah so it will be interesting and i definitely want to visit there to try and see what is happening there and these are across, let me tell you one thing is that wheat hornbills are behaving differently in different areas. Right now, what I suspect is in the Northeast India, where we see the populations are all breeding in Myanmar. And they are coming seasonally into the areas in winter. And this is something which even the hunters have told me that they see wheat hornbills only in winter. So safeguarding their population. So in different areas, they are behaving differently. We probably 
suspect and one of the ideas of the telemetry project was also to catch breathorn bills and to get these tags solar tags to get, understand their long range movements but unfortunately those solar tags did not work these tags which were supposed to give us long term information on movements of horn bills did not work and therefore we could not get that but that potentially holds clues but that is again on the radar which we hope that we'll be able to do that sometime in the future and probably answer your question that time but why they are rare in the, those areas maybe this is overkill in the conservation debate but hunting i mean especially since you said you work with hunters because they can identify species i mean how do they see you as you know as someone who's focused clearly on like with an agenda of conserving hornbills and in terms of you know putting an end to their practices and generally the cultural and community aspect of that i know i mean i get it yeah uh, you know if they're habitats are decreasing and there are also numbers are decreasing i get that it's a concern from a conservation perspective but there has to be i mean there has to be a negotiation of that tension with people that say well we've been doing this for a long time and who are you to come in and tell us what not to do yeah so this is a very nice question so essentially we are not reaching them what they have to do what they are not to do so even the nest adoption program let me tell you like hunters have a heart and across most of course and this is a very uh, tautological statement that i just said but what i mean is that hunting taboos are there in northeast india also people have hunting taboos like the great horn bills many across several different communities people do not hunt them in the breeding season now these are either reflected through the beliefs they have where they say that oh if we kill a horn bill that it will affect our family but these taboos have come from the fact that somebody has at some point realized that these have part these species has a very interesting breeding habit and that it needs to be probably to save to save the female and the chick that these species can't be hunted in the so these systems already exist and we just have to tap on those and develop on those and we don't expect these transformations to happen overnight and these are not transformations we expect but our only hope is that when they watch the hornbills themselves at the nest that is enough and if they are able to do that come and see the male feeding the female for several months that itself is something which actually transforms and that we've had a direct experience with our nest protectors many of them were hunters in the past but over the period and there's a nice documentary on that where this one protector very candidly says it that madam bolta hai interest lo interest lo aata nahi hai then one day i saw the male coming and feeding the female ekdam maya lag gaya that's the chord we are try, strike trying to strike with the local people where we are working with and therefore it is a process which is very difficult to scale up because it is not something which is very fast and something which is very uh, you know easily that can be achieved and therefore we want to focus our attentions and energy and go side by side and try and explore and try and see if we can we can build this uh, you know this kind of passion for hornbills and the love for hornbills that we share and that basically create that common space yeah 